everyone. Uh, welcome to the VIA Medical Adult Ventilation Webinar. My name is Graham McCourt. I'm the Global KO Manager for Adult Ventilation. Today's topic, um, it's an interesting topic. It's on the essential lung mechanics for operating closed loop ventilation. And that's, uh, I think, very important that we discuss lung mechanics. We're privileged to know that our speaker is Professor Yu Chin Wang, or most of us call him Tony, and he is a professor of medicine in the Division of Pulmonary Analogy and Critical Care Medicine at the Duke University Medical Center in Durham, North Carolina. So Tony has published over 75 journal articles, multiple books, um, topics such as COPD, arterial blood gases, mechanical ventilation, are the, the key topics. Within mechanical ventilation, uh, his interests are in respiratory mechanics, of course, and especially the use of adaptive ventilation. He has lectured extensively um, nationally and internationally and is well known on these topics. Tony, welcome to our webinar. It's a great privilege to have you with us. And um, please, if I've missed something about you, you want to top up, please do otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to present today uh, on this topic, um, the essential pulmonary mechanics for operating closed loop ventilation. Um, it's, to me, pulmonary mechanics uh, is such a basic uh, knowledge that you need to skill, you, you need for operating any mechanical ventilation. And in fact, that was actually my first research topic when I was at Johns Hopkins, when I first came to US. So it's uh, dear, dear, dear to me uh, to talk about this again. Um, I think there are probably in the audience, there are you know, a lot of experts in there and I'm go just gonna review um, many things that you probably already know. Uh, so just bear with us because be before I got into the, get into the closed loop ventilation. So mechanical ventilation, there are conveniently, can be convenient, conveniently divided into different modes. The most common one is what we call single mode. Um, and this includes pressure support, uh, IMV, pressure assist control, and volume assist control. And you use it every day uh, in the ICU. Then there is so-called a dual mode. Um, these are the VAPS mode, pressure augmentation or PA, volume support, and there's a pressure regulated volume control PRVC, which is pretty popular. It's called dual mode because there is a loop out there, feedback loop. Most of the time, the tidal volume uh, is used uh, as a feedback uh, parameter to, to maintain this, this minimum tidal volume. Then there's more complicated um, loop um, mode, we call it closed loop, advanced closed loop. I mean, there is really no closed loop ventilator um, you know, today, but these are more complicated because there are multiple loops in it. Adaptive support ventilation or SV, knowledge base, KBS, uh, proportional assist, NAVA and, uh, and the ABM, adaptive ventilation uh, mode. So these, 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 ventilator, these ventilation modes have multiple loops. Uh, so they're, they're a bit more complicated. And I think the knowledge of mechanical uh, or pulmonary mechanics are basically essential in order to operate these modes because there, are, there is something hidden um, uh, in there. When you look at the mechanism of how the ventilator is operated, uh, there's also called the open loop control. Um, this is uh, applied to the single uh, mode that we just talked about. So the physician will put in the input um, uh, settings, you, you put tidal volume, respiratory rate, you know, all those things at bio 2 It goes into the ventilator and they deliver the settings to the patient uh, and there's so-called the output variable. So for example, the volume assist control, the output variable will include the peak pressure, peak area pressure. Um, and all these output variable, um, that's it. We have to see it. You look at it and then say, okay, I'm gonna change the ventilator uh, because the output variable, for example, peak air pressure is too high. If there's something wrong between the ventilator and the patient, the alarm will sound. And hopefully somebody uh, notices and then 
we'll go back to change the setting. Then the so-called closed loop control. Um, so this is a loop. Uh, you still put in some settings, but usually the settings are uh, for the advanced closed loop. It's not really tidal volume or rate, as you will see a little bit later. Uh, you put in that mini ventilation. And then again, you go through the ventilator, ventilator goes through the patient, and then again, the output variables. Now the difference here is that some of the output variables will go back to the ventilator. Uh, it's a feedback uh, loop. So it becomes a loop. Uh, so this is a closed loop. So this loop will continue to run until at some point uh, it cannot run anymore. So for example, the pedal volume just cannot be decreased anymore and it will start to alarm. And hopefully somebody will notice it and then go back to change the input setting. I wanted to um, make sure that this alarm is different from the alarm that I uh, in the open loop control. When the closed loop control alarms, usually something bad happens. So this alarm uh, should not be just silenced. Uh, you need to really look at it, uh, see what happened. Um, well, I'm not that old. Um, I have not seen this 1951 Armstrong 150 ventilator, uh, but this is a one of the first mechanical ventilator and the airway pressure manometer is in that little um, round thing over there. And then you have a spirometer to give you the tidal volume. And this is pretty big, a bulky uh, ventilator. And then MA1, uh, Bennett, I actually have upgraded MA1 when I was a resident. Um, and this MA1 uh, tidal volume is that uh, little accordion thing over there. It goes up and you look at it and say, okay, this is about 300 cc tidal volume. And then air pressure monitoring still in the analog, uh, like a clock, like um, uh, stuff on the left upper corner. And then you can change the, the stuff with this all these knobs uh, on the ventilator. By the way, MA1 is still available on eBay, so it's pretty cheap these days. And then you got this um, nowadays, um, the, the, the modern ventilators, um, basically it's a ventilator plus monitor. Uh, so it, because of the computer, now the, um, the ventilator can calculate many things. Uh, you can monitor um, uh, a lot of the air with pressure, tidal volume and all those things um, on, um, uh, instantaneously. So there are a huge um, number of different uh, parameters uh, on the ventilator these days. And, and I'm, I'm gonna talk about the automatic measurements um, later. And then there are also other measurement tools that have been developed, for example, the PV tool and automatic uh, tube compensation and so on. So these are the, the modern ventilators, um, uh, what's different uh, of this modern ventilator and with, from the older one is that the screens is much better interface and then the, the increased monitoring capability. So again, let me show you this one. This is MA1 and you can see that you have to use the hand to calculate many things. Um, and But now this is a new ventilator here and you can see the screen looks much better. There's actually no screen for MA1. You can see the screen and even tell you the, all these little white dot, the air going into the lung. Um, uh, so it's looks very complicated, um, but the basic mechanics uh, does not change. So when we talk about lung mechanics, um, there are four basic parameters. Uh, the pressure in centimeter water, flow in liter per second, Volume usually is in liter, sometimes in milliliter, and time in second. These are the basic parameters that all the lung mechanics, uh, whatever you calculate, um, it all based on these four mechanic four parameters. Uh, many derived uh, parameters. They all came out of these four. So let me just review with you. Um, this is a a um, a graphic for a volume control uh, ventilation ventilator. The top panel here is the flow. The second one is the tidal volume or the volume. Third one is the airway pressure. And the bottom one we don't usually have is the esophageal pressure. You need a balloon, esophageal balloon in order to, to see it. Um, but this is listed here. 
um, as the fourth uh, panel. But most of the time in, on the ventilator, you have the flow volume and pressure. This is a volume control ventilation because um, the flow is fixed. And this patient is in control ventilation, meaning that there is no uh, trigger. There's no um, respiratory drive. So, um, so you know the A, that's peak inspiratory flow, which is fixed. B is a peak expiratory flow. C is the tidal volume. So this, this patient's tidal volume is somewhere around one liters or so. Peak airway pressure is D. And then you have a plateau pressure. The plateau pressure um, usually doesn't display automatically. You have to do an inspiratory hold in order to see the plateau pressure. And then an F is the end expiratory airway pressure, or we call it PEEP. So you will see the PEEP there in F. And G is the expiratory uh, esophageal pressure. Now, this is a control ventilation, so there's no no, no uh, trigger there. There's no negative pressure. So G is end expiratory esophageal pressure. And H is the end inspiratory esophageal pressure, positive. Now, I is inspiratory time up there. And J is the expiratory time. So this IE ratio is I over J. Now K is the inspiratory flow time. As you can see here, the, the inspiratory flow time, inspiratory flow time is um, usually slower, shorter than the inspiratory time because sometimes there's an inspiratory hold. Um, uh, but That's it, not nice. What's that? Um, and then there's an inspiratory hold time, that's L. So you do the inspiratory pause, then you will see the, the L. That's where you, you do the inspiratory hold. So, and there are pressures during mechanical ventilation. There's an airway pressure. Now airway pressure, peak airway pressure here is measured at the proximal uh, ET tube. This is different from the trachea pressure, which is usually measured at, at the distal end of the, of the ET tube. These two pressure can be different because you've got a length there that gives you the resistance there. Then you have the alveolar pressure. Uh, alveolar pressure um, can usually is measured by uh, or estimated by plateau pressure, inspiratory hold. Alveolar pressure represents the recoil uh, force uh, of the lung. And then the uh, pleural pressure um, which is estimated by esophageal pressure. Then there are other pressure we use in the ICU sometimes, uh, like gastric pressure, central venous pressure, and bladder pressure. These are all can, can be affected by the, the mechanical ventilation, or they actually affect the mechanical ventilation too. You know, for example, if the abdominal pressure is too high, then the blood bladder pressure or gastric pressure will be high, and it actually can affect the um, lung volume and the compliance of the respiratory system. Then you have this derived pressure. Um, derived pressure meaning that you, you do some mathematics of, of these, these, these uh, basic parameters. So you have a lung, uh, a chest wall in the lung. So you have an alveolar pressure minus pleural pressure, which we call that a transpulmonary pressure. Transpulmonary pressure uh, it's a important um, derived pressure because it's affected by the lung compliance. And then you have a bottom here, a alveolar pressure minus barometric pressure, PBS, which is a, a compliance of the whole entire uh, respiratory system, including the chest wall. And then of course you can the chest wall compliance that's in the middle one there. Um, in, in, in the mechanical, in the ICU, we don't usually have pleural pressure. So what we're talking about here, most of the, most of the time is this trans respiratory system pressure. Remember there is a chest wall there, which is probably even more, can be more important than the lung uh, in, in, uh, in, in the whole management. You know, you, if you have, uh, for example, you sedate the patient, paralyze the patient, uh, it changed the chest wall compliance, but not the lung. Okay? So when the changes happen, uh, it can be just the chest wall, not the lung getting better. 
So from that, you we have three compliances. One is the non-compliance, which is the delta V over delta P. Delta V is the tidal volume. And delta P is the alveolar pressure minus pool pressure. That's a lung compliance. And then you have a chest wall compliance and you have the respiratory system compliance. As I said, in the ICU here, we pretty much measure respiratory system compliance. It's really not lung compliance. And these compliance can be, uh, they're in series. So you can see that the bottom uh, equation here is the inverse of the compliance the respiratory system equals to uh, inverse of the lung compliance and inverse of the chest wall compliance. And because it's in series, so you, 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 you just add them up. This is another important slide on the pressure volume relationship of the respiratory system. Uh, so the y-axis is the vital capacity in percent and the x-axis is in pressure. If you look at the lung, which is um, on the right here, the little dot, dot. so the lung uh, compliance, it's, first of all, it's not linear uh, and it's, it's curvilinear and it's concave downward, right? So uh, because of the recoil. So if you open the chest, lung will collapse. Now the chest wall, just the opposite, the other curve on the left, uh, it's a concave upward. So if you open the chest, chest wall will expand. So lung will collapse and chest wall will expand. And if you put these two together, you get the central, the, the solid line in the middle here. Again, it's a nonlinear curve. It's almost a sigmoid, but it's a nonlinear um, uh, curve here. So what we're dealing with in the ICU is actually the central, this, this solid line here. We're not dealing with lung compliance. We're dealing with the respiratory system compliance here. So um, when the pressure is zero, delta P is zero, that's where the FRC is. Then there is, everyone knows that the lung has hysteresis. Um, if you take the lung out, the lung collapse. Uh, but when you inflate the lung, um, it inflate following, following uh, the curve at the bottom here, when you deflate, uh, it's another curve. So there's an there's a, uh, area in between the two and that's the surface uh, force. Um, so surfactant keep this uh, hysteresis uh, present. If you inflate with the saline and there's no surfactant uh, surface force, then it, there's no hysteresis at all. Now, because this is a lung, lung property of the lung, uh, the hysteresis of the entire respiratory system is still there. Uh, but it's certainly not um, the chest wall is going to affect affect this uh, hysteresis. Chest wall doesn't have the hysteresis that much as some. So compliance is a static measurement. It needs to be measured at the no flow state. Uh, this is one of the first things that I actually learned when I was at Hopkins uh, studying with my 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 boss. He said never measure compliance when the flow is around. It's my first dog experiment. And compliance of the lung and hence the respiratory system um, varies with lung volume at which the compliance is measured due to the hysteresis. So the different lung volume give you lung, different compliance, right? Um, so in the upper part of the lung, uh, in, a, in the upright person, the compliance is low. And then in the uh, lower part of the lung, the compliance is higher. Lung compliance, the compliance can have significant regional variation, you know, like in ARDS. So ARDS um, is a heterogeneous lung injury. So there are some areas that are not less affected. So the compliance will be better in that area, but that you can have another unit of alveolar, alveolar unit next to it that is, has very low compliance. And the so-called dynamic compliance, I think it's on the ventilator. Uh, they give you the compliance number. Uh, this is down to true compliance uh, because the dynamic compliance, uh, it involves a combination of lung compliance and airway resistance because it's not measured at no flow state. So that when we talk about dynamic compliance in the ventilator, when they tell you that it's not a true compliance. Uh, so we need to remember that. Uh, I simply just divided the tidal volume with a the differences between the airway pressure and peak, that's not the compliance. It has to be uh, no flow. So when there's a fungal spasm, this dynamic compliance, so-called, 
will change, will decrease. Then you have the dynamic measurement, we call it resistance. Again, there are, there are three resistances in the respiratory system. You got airway resistance, and it's a delta P divided by the flow. Uh, delta P is the alveolar pressure. Actually, I did I do the, uh, the air, um, uh, barometric pressure, the oral pressure at the, at the mouth, minus the alveolar pressure, because this is a spontaneous breathing patient. And pulmonary resistance, um, again, is the pressure gradient between the mouth and the pleural, and the chest wall uh, tissue uh, resistance. Of, of these three resistances, uh, we deal with the airway resistance the most, right? I mean, we don't, because we don't have the pleural pressure. The area resistance, um, if you look at the lung anatomy and on the left here is the resistance on the Y axis and then the um, anatomic location of the airways from the trachea on the left to all the way to the alveolar spaces. You can see that the airway resistance is initially increased from trachea to the bronchus major bronchi, but it started to decrease uh, um, quickly. Uh, when you go down to the terminal bronchi of the small airways, there's really no resistance at all. So when there is an increase in airway resistance, uh, we pretty much talk about talking about uh, some pathology uh, in the proximal uh, airways. Small airway disease does not contribute to airway resistance. In fact, uh, some people estimated that only 10% of the airway resistance uh, comes from the small airways. And also uh, on the right, it tells you the proximal airway, the flow is turbulent. And the, and the distal airway is a lamina. So, and there's a transition flow in between. So turbulent flow um, actually does not follow uh, this typical equation of airway resistance equals delta P divided by the flow. Turbulent flow, um, it, it's different because it has a turbulence in it. So that equation only applies to lamina flow. Uh, in fact, um, you have to square that uh, the delta P uh, in order to come up with um, uh, the resistance in the proximal airway. But again, it's a turbulence, turbulent flow in the proximal airway. And what we measure, the airway resistance um, uh, measured in the, in the ventilator, on the ventilator, for example, in fact, it doesn't use that typical uh, resistance for turbulent flow. So it could be higher um, than what's uh, displayed on the ventilator. So airway resistance, um, the airway diameter obviously is the major determinant because it's uh, to the fourth order in red here. Of course, resistance also varies with lung volume, I'll show you later. Resistance differs during inspiration and expiration. Uh, it's greater during expiration because during inspiration, the lung expands. So airways also um, are bigger in diameter. Airway resistance, in ventilated patient is a reflection of two resistances in series, that's patients and the ventilator's airway. And this is important too. Um, when you see an increase in airway resistance or peak airway pressure, it could be in the circuit, not the patient. Resistance can have significant regional variations also like COPD patients, asthma patients, they're, they're, when they have wheezing, it, it, it is, it is a significant regional variation. It's not all the airways uh, have bronchospasm. This slide shows the re relationship between airway resistance and lung volume. As you can see here, the upper panel here is an airway resistance on the y-axis, um, the lung volume on the x. The bottom here is, is conductance. Basically, it's just the inverse of the resistance so that it becomes a straight line. Uh, so you can see in this, this, this uh, so on this slide here at FRC, you see the resistance there somewhere you know, between about four. So if you increase the P, lung volume increases and resistance will decrease some, it'll decrease. But if you decrease the P or electrolysis, the resistance increase much more uh, than you know, on this side because it's nonlinear. So when the volume, lung volume is low, resistance, airway resistance will increase are much more uh, because the diameter of the airway um, to the fourth order, it, it affects the resistance. But when it, you are in increase the lung volume because lung is sort of open already, um, the resistance will decrease, uh, but not by that much. So this is a curvilinear relationship 
between the two. Then the time constant. This is also an important concept. Time constant is the time it takes for the lung to passively empty 63% of its air or equals to resistance times compliance. It's interesting enough, it, when you put these two together, uh, the unit is second, it's time, okay? So uh, the time constant determines how the lung empties. Uh, expiration uh, uh, usually is a passive process unless the patient is actively doing the expiration, but most of the time expiration is passive. So it is determined by the lung compliance and the resistance. So there are some diseases with shorter time constants, for example, ARDS, so the lung empties okay because compliance is low. So they, these patients usually have no problem uh, in air trapping. On the other hand, uh, airway disease like emphysema or asthma, they have longer time constants. It favors slow emptying. So because the resistance is high or um, end or compliance is low, like emphysema, these patients can get uh, significant air trapping uh, because again, the exploration is passive and is determined by the compliance and the resistance. The time constant uh, can be calculated by the machine uh, in the modern machine that we'll talk about later. So this um, illustrates the time constant on the y-axis is the volume, and the x-axis is time. And in the normal lung, the lung will empty, and at one time constant is 63%, and five time constant is 95% air off. When emphysema, for example, the wine time, because it's the time constant is quite long, so then by by it takes almost ten time constants in order to reach the ninety percent, ninety five percent. So uh, it just show you shows you that this is one of the things that when you manage mechanical ventilation, the time constant that always has to be in your mind, so that you can manage uh, better, but the, so that it will not cause the excessive air trapping. Air trapping uh, can cause what we call intrinsic peep or auto peep. Uh, this is a slide that shows um, on the left, uh, flow targeted breath or the volume control, volume ventilator. And you can see that the pressure on the uh, upper panel, the middle is a flow. Again, the, the fixed flow and the bottom is the tidal volume. And you can see that uh, the expiratory flow um, does not go back to zero before the next breath starts. This difference here indicates there's a presence of, of um, auto peep or air trapping. In the pressure targeted breath and pressure control, it's the same. Again, you see that um, in the flow, uh, the flow does not go back to zero before the next breath. And it indicates the presence of intrinsic peep. This is the most sensitive way to detect intrinsic peep, but it does not give you the number. But anytime you go into the room, uh, patients who are on, on the ventilator, I checked every day uh, to look at the graphic, make sure that there is no um, uh, intrinsic peak there. Intrinsic peak can be caused by the patient's uh, lung pathology, airway obstruction can also be caused by us when you, when you ventilate the patient with a very high rate and the lung does not have time to relax. You can measure it. Uh, inspector, expiratory hold. So at the end expiration, you push the button and then you know the flow stop and then the pressure in the lung or whatever the pressure uh, air got trapped in the lung will uh, equilibrate and it'll give you uh, some number here. So in this patient is you can see that it's probably there's some pressure still in there. So it can measure it. Um, however, uh, this is not a true intrinsic P because when you uh, hold, do an expiratory hold, the pressure in the lung will equilibrate. Uh, so it's some kind of weighted average of, of the <clears throat> of intrinsic P, okay? But sometimes you just cannot measure it because the patient is breathing too fast. Um, and so expiratory hold some work, um, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it'll give you this um, sinus wave, it doesn't give you a number. And so you can do it. I mean, these days the, um, the ventilator can, can just time it for you. In the past, in the MA1, you have to kind of time it yourself um, in order to get a good measurement of intrinsic peak. Well, let's go into the continuous measurement of lung mechanics for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. 
So, as I said, in order to do that, you have to know what's the resistance, airway resistance and the compliance in the respiratory system. This is one of the most important measurements. Um, so in the past, we, as I said, we, we manually calculated, you got a res um, respiratory system uh, resistance, peak air pressure minus P divided by flow. You have a compliance of the respiratory system that's tidal volume divided by plateau pressure minus P. So you calculate it yourself. However, in the automated um, the mode, um, it, it actually uh, take it, takes advantage of this um, equation of motion. This is Newton's second uh, law, uh, equation motion. So in a, in, in a patient who has no respiratory effort or breathing uh, comfortably, uh, the total pressure in the system, which is PAPPL, equals ERS, which is respiratory system elastins. Now, elastin is the inverse of the compliance um, times tidal volume, BT, plus uh, respiratory system resistance times flow plus the peak, okay? It could be the RP or intrinsic peak. So the first term here <clears throat> is the pressure that will resist the lung collapse. The second one, the resistance part, is the pressure that's needed to move the flow. And then the last pressure is the peak. So this is it happens to be a multiple linear regression equation. So Y equals AX plus BZ plus C. So if you were able to give the, the put in data uh, there, at least three or four, then you can solve this equation by linear uh, least square uh, methods. So this is the least square fitting methods. So you, a lot of these ventilators would do tests, um, test breath and they measure breath by breath. As you can see, when each breath goes in, we'll come back with some data. So after, after a while, you can see that you, you can draw a line, um, uh, then you can solve for the dependent variables, which are the, the three um, uh, coefficients uh, that equivalent to compliance, resistance, and uh, peak. So you compare this uh, compliance measure by the least square methods and the manual uh, measurements. You can see that the compliance is actually not bad at all. It's it's pretty good. There's a C dynamic and the quasi static com compliance there. It's actually not too bad. Um, but the resistance, there's a little problem here. Um, resistance is measured by the least square methods, uh, especially the minimum part and the maximum. You can see that uh, it can underestimate or overestimate a lot more. There's a lot more scatter um, uh, between the two. You can still draw a line. The line is a line of identity. Uh, but there are a lot more variables there. And it's important to know because, you know, you, the, the numbers are numbers, but if they are not reliable, it'll give you the wrong uh, results. So the breathing effort is a major uh, factor that determines uh, the variability uh, between the, the two measurements. So in this slide, on this slide here, the left, uh, the x-axis, uh, the y-axis is the difference between the uh, compliance measured by these square methods and the manual methods. On the y-axis is P0.1, which measure the respiratory drive. So you, as you can see, when it's to zero, our uh, low number of P0.1, um, the difference is, is closer to zero, which is the, the solid, solid line. That, and then when you, let's say this is peer support, basic based on peer support. So you add five, which is the, the X here, you can see that they were center around zero. At 10, again, it's center around zero, but if you take five minus five, you can see that these square are now all over the place. So patient has to be, in order to use the least square uh, methods, the patient has to, be, had to breathe comfortably. They cannot have um, significant respiratory drive or air hunger. Resistance is even worse. So. Again, the x, y axis is, is the difference between the least square resistance and the um, manual resistance. The x axis is a P0.1. So you can see that even, even if the patient is breathing uh, comfortably, um, not a whole lot of effort, you can see that it's still underestimate, right? The, the airway resistance, um, 
and when the breathing effort increases, um, like in this um, square, uh, the underestimation increases uh, even more. Uh, so this is the caveats that you we have to we have to know because a lot of these continuous measurements depends on the accurate measurement of resistance and compliance. What about P? Is it the, 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 in that equation is the last uh, term item here. So here, the P measured by the square on the Y axis and the P measured by the, by the, um, uh, on, on the X axis. When there's a low pressure support, um, it's actually correlates pretty well, but it's not on, on uh, a line of identity, all right? So it tends to underestimate uh, the actual P, intense, uh, intrinsic P. Um, for the high pressure support, it gets better, right? So high pressure support will take away the respiratory drive. Patients are more comfortable. Low pressure support, uh, the, the respiratory drive is higher. So again, um, uh, it's, it performs better when the patient is breathing comfortably with almost no respiratory drive. Uh, even with the high pressure support, the um, the P intrinsic P or P measured by these square methods still underestimate um, the actual P. Then there's this work of breathing. We mentioned the P zero point one, which is the uh, pulmonary occlusion pressure at one hundred milliseconds after the onset of inspiratory effort. Uh, this is the one uh, before the valve opens. Um, they reflect the work of breathing and the respiratory drive, and there's some normal value here. And then just pressure time products, uh, PDP, that we measure the work of breathing. So there are two work of breathing. One is that respiratory drive just the, at the beginning, uh, and then there's a pressure time products. So the P.1 uh, usually measure this way. Um, there's a button, you can do it on the ventilator. You push and then you'll time it. Uh, it'll give you this, 100 millisecond after the onset of, of the, of the uh, occlusion start right there in the arrow here. Uh, so before the valve open, um, this is the P.1. So patient is uh, breathing against the closed valve. <clears throat> pressure time product is another way to measure work of breathing. Uh, in this particular um, uh, slide here uh, on the left, this is a synchronous assisted breath. The patient has synchronous pretty good. Then you can see that it's a very nice uh, triangular shape waveform. This is a pressure, pressure uh, ventilator ventilation. But if there's a desynchrony, you can see that this is the red part. Here is the patient's work of breathing. Uh, the, the other part is the machine work of breathing. So you can see that in the desynchrony, you actually can measure the area um, that represents the patient's work of breathing. So the closed loop ventilation, I'm just gonna focus on the ASV and AVM today because it is the, the, the two modes that will give you um, a recommended um, the, uh, respiratory rate and tidal volume based on the lung mechanics. Before I do that, uh, I'm gonna go into this um, several concepts here. Otis in 1950, I've uh, done an experiment uh, in I think four four subjects uh, who were breathing spontaneously and quiet. Uh, he's found out so on the right side is the work of breathing on the on the x axis is the respiratory frequency. So he can you, we, the work of breathing uh, during our our um, uh, breathing here with the work during our breathing here can be divided uh, into three things here. We have three um, uh, work uh, or breathing uh, elements here. One is the turbulent. Uh, we have to push the air into the lung. So this work here increases when the respiratory rate is higher. This is mostly airway resistance. Then you have this non-compliance part. The lung is trying to collapse. So you have to have pressure to resist that. So that work of breathing increase when the rate is slower because the lung volume is bigger. Then you have something in between the viscous uh, viscosity, which is the air quality, uh, density, um, uh, you know, composition. So when you put these three together, you have this curve on the top here. 
um, you can see that he say, oh, there's a minimum work of breathing. And in this case happens at a frequency of about 15 or so. Based on that, um, this so-called Altice equation of breathing power, uh, you can uh, actually come up with this very complicated uh, equation here. Um, and uh, he, he says the patient will breathe at a tidal volume respiratory frequency combination that minimizes the elastic and resistive loads. Now that's, a, that's actually a, a, a big leap of, of the, the concept. Because the, the study actually was done in a spontaneously breathing normal subjects. All right. Whether the patient actually followed that, uh, we're not sure. But again, regardless, this is an equation. Uh, you see that there's a time constant on both on the numerator and the denominator. MV is the mini ventilation, VD is the dead space. So if you put in the dead space, which is we can estimate, and if you just put in this mini ventilation that you want, um, the machine will measure. Um, time constant because it'll continuously measure resistance and compliance expiratory. You all know this, you can solve for the frequency. Right? And this obviously requires the computer to do it. There's no way that human can actually do it manually. Um, based on that, so ASV uses this equation to give you the combination of respiratory rate and tidal volume. The Again, as, as I said, this, that equation, that minimum work of breathing equation is in spontaneous breathing patients and uh, should be breathing comfortably. So there's, if it's the controlled breathing, it works pretty well. So this is a, on the screen of ASV, you can see the tidal volume on the, on the left, on the y-axis, respiratory rate on the X. So this green line is the, um, the um, solution uh, for that OTS equation. And you can see right here, uh, for that mini ventilation of seven. You have different combination. You can breathe 14 times a minute or 400 cc or 15 times a minute. And you can, you can breathe 10, 10, uh, 10 per minute uh, with a very high tidal volume. So, uh, so they put in a, a, a safety box here. But if, if the patient doesn't breathe, it works pretty well. However, if the patient started to breathe, um, there's no way that it'll reach that target. Uh, because it's all over the place, it's coming around that. So it's just hard to reach that. Uh, so does, in this patient, the breathing, patient is breathing 17, 17 times a minute. There's no way that you can, if you, if you ever operate an SV, you can see that it's dancing around that target. It will never reach that target of, of this, of this um, mini ventilation of 6.7 liter per minute. Then there is this so-called mechanical power. Uh, mechanical power um, is the amount of energy transfer convert per unit time. Uh, it's the force times velocity. Uh, this is this equation, differential equation. And this is again, even more complicated equation, uh, but mechanical power equation. Fortunately, we have computer. And again, it can, same measurements, it'll give you the uh, respiratory rate and tidal volume uh, recommendation. It, it minimizes inspiratory power. Now, inspiratory power, uh, really just to make sure that your tidal volume is not too high because you have to push uh, a lot of tidal volume there your power it will require a lot of mechanical power. So that's the AVM uh, that adaptive ventilation mode use that mechanical power equation. So uh, if you compare to ASV or the OTS equation, you can see this is an alarm model. Uh, you can see that it does what it's supposed to do in the rate, it'll be the higher rate than the OTS rate. Uh, it's a lower tidal volume on the, uh, compared to the Otis, it, what it's supposed to do because it's, this is a lower uh, inspiratory power at seven liter per minute. And again, this, this one shows in a hypothetical 70 kilogram uh, patients uh, breathing uh, with a resistance of 10 um, and compliance of 30. And you can see that uh, AVM again with a little higher rate, um, lower tidal volume. Um, and tidal volume per kilogram is uh, lower too. They all have safety features. They both have safety feature because they all have this curve, um, uh, that combination that can go from a thousand cc tidal volume, uh, five breath per minute. So you need to have a um, uh, safety here. So they both have the safety box here and you cannot exceed that. If it 
exceed that, the, the machine will alarm. And as I said earlier at the very beginning, when the machine alarms, you have to take a look. There's something serious going on here. So this is, um, it'll alarm when, um, when it exceeds the safety box, it cannot operate. It happens in uh, patients who are very sick in ARDS. Sometimes the tidal volume is just too slow. It cannot be in the box. Right? And the breathing target is different. Um, the ASV target is right here, but, but for the ABM, you calculate the rate right here. It's a little bit higher. Uh, when the patient started to breathe spontaneously, I think ASV, ABM can adapt a little bit better um, than, than the ASV. ASV, it will be, uh, again, it, it cannot reach that target. Uh, so there's a one study that compared the two. Now, ABM and ABM2. ABM2 is in the current, um, um, uh, but that's uh, the ventilator. ABM is an older one. It's similar to the Otis equation, it's just a, a little modification. If you compare the two, um, you can see that, again, ABM2, which is using the mechanical power equation, it has uh, lower tidal volume, um, higher respiratory rate. That's what it's supposed to do. Respiratory pressure is lower. This doesn't really need that pressure to deliver a tidal volume. Uh, so um, we're just given the same mini ventilation. So recommendation is a little bit different. Um, the, uh, if you go by the breathing power or this equation, the tidal volume can be a little bit higher than the mechanical uh, recommendation by mechanical power. And the, the ABG is, is, I mean, it's statistics and we can hear, but it's put it to me, it's about the same 290 or 270 or PF ratio it should be about the same. Um, in ARDS patients, um, of the 20 patients in that study, 10 of them have ARDS, again, it holds up um, lower tidal volume, a little bit higher respiratory rate. So um, let me just conclude. Um, so the, this modern ventilator um, with automated uh, modes uh, had the ability to measure lung mechanics continuously. And this is um, a significant uh, advancement uh, because the, the computer can calculate uh, quickly, very fast. Now, based on these measurements, the algorithm can be developed and has been developed to recommend a so-called optimal respiratory rate and tidal volume combination to ventilate the lung. Depends on the, the um, uh, pathology of the lung, whether it's obstructive or uh, restrictive. Dr. AVM uh, uses the algorithm that based on mechanical power. Uh, because of that, uh, I tend to put the focus on tidal volume. Uh, but um, what ASV uses the algorithm based on breathing power, so it focuses on respiratory rate a little more. So the ASV will give you a lower respiratory rate uh, than the AVM. Um, so I just said. So if you use a lower tidal volume, it could be more lung protective in ARDS patient. Uh, however, um, we, we need outcome studies. Um, this is a very nice mechanical uh, lung mechanics uh, that is supposed to uh, work better, but I think we still need the clinical outcome study um, uh, for all the closed loop ventilations. Um, so that these, these um, uh, almost a theoretical calculation, uh, good, nice, and based on the good hypothesis, a good um, uh, hypothesis should, can be translated to um, uh, uh, actual improved uh, outcome. And that's all I have. Um, and I will be glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Tony, thank you. Yes. That was good. Do you want to get rid of the, um, the black box screen? Um, yeah. Well, that, that was very good. And um, I, I think for many people watching this, it's, it's a good, it makes people think a lot more about ventilation. We, we often ventilate, like you said at the beginning, we look at the tidal volume, we look at the pressure, and we assume with a bit of peep, everything is, is all fine. Even compliance, which to me is something which we know is part of um, aut automation, like you, you mentioned, but even for conventional ventilation, measuring compliance is important. And I, I suppose 
that, like you said before, that the gold standard for compliance, static compliance, is, is, a, is a hold maneuver, right? Which was the, the which is the right thing. And, and of course, there are some issues there. Are you happy with muscle relaxants or or, or whatever? Um, or are you happy enough to look at the dynamic compliance, which is more like a trending, looking at the trend? Um, Tony, can you just get rid of your slideshow, please? Uh, share, sharing your screen, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is it, and would you agree with that, though? Those yes. Points? Yes, yes. Um, the, you know, mm -hmm. there, there are measurements and there are measurements and the data we just need to be sure because it is even more important to operate a closed loop ventilation. You you have to really know the mechanics even more than you know when you operate just a single mode uh, because there is something hidden behind it. Uh, it only gives you the final product. Uh, you really need to know number one the data is correct, uh, how they come up, and you know all those things. So uh, it's actually to me is a good exercise for me every time when I look at it. And I said, huh, this is, I, I actually had to think about it. Yeah. I think the other point you brought up too was important too about the expiratory time constant. And I think clinicians don't think about it. For you and I that were trained that way, it was a bit, it's a bit different. But, uh, you know, people, people just look at blood gases or, or, or look at some sort of target. They say, oh, I'm going to have 14 breaths per minute, 400 ml tidal volume. I time of one second, 1 1.5 second, but they don't look at the expiratory component, even the impact, for example, of the endotracheal tube, like a small tube versus a larger tube, right? Mm -hmm. These things all come into play. And then they wonder why, um, especially with airflow obstruction, that the patient's not spontaneously breathing. We think they are, but they're not because the machine is not reacting to the trigger. Yep. Yeah. So, um... I think the time constant concept, uh, it should be in, in the day-to-day -day practice. In every patient, uh, you have to, I, I talked about intrinsic P, but I think time constant is is so important. You, you need to look at it and it, it, the common mistakes is in a patient with COPD and you you, you put on some kind of settings and uh, you saw the PCO2 was seven, 70. Uh, so then the next one is to you go up the rate. Uh, right, so uh, it still happens here, even at Duke. Um, it's it's just the if you think about it, the time constant is so long, you have to give the patient enough time to exhale. So it should be the opposite to decrease the rate, and it's counterintuitive, but that's how time constant is important here. Yeah. Um. Just one question, then I think we've got some questions from the audience. Um, I just, one more thing that you started off with, I'd like you to sort of comment on, and it's not really related to the automation, but it's to do with the, um, you mentioned about esophageal pressure. And um, yeah, it's, you know, as you know, it can be, we'll say sexy sometimes, sometimes with studies, then sometimes not so, you know, they're very negative. But just for, for everybody's uh, understanding, um, would you like to just give, give your view on what patients that you think um, we should be using esophageal balloons in? Is, is it the obese patient or, or is it right. IRDS or what? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, I, we, you know, here uh, we typically think about esophageal balloon in somebody who is um, very obese. Uh, remember, the chest wall plays an important role here in compliance. Uh, so uh, some of the peeps that we apply to the pa to the patient, maybe uh, that's needed to support to um, the, the chest wall, not the lung. So we wanted to know uh, how high a peep we can go. Uh, so we use the esophageal pressure because if you, you put an esophageal balloon, then you can calculate the true lung compliance. Uh, the rest of it is going to be the chest wall. Uh, so in you know, obese patients, uh, sometimes we go up to 22, 24 peep uh, without the esophageal balloon. I don't think a lot of people are comfortable putting the peep up there in the 20s and 22. Uh, 
but we were able to do that. So most of the time, this is the indication that we 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 have here for esophageal balloon um, in the very obese, especially very obese patients. So, that, so that's my questions. We've got two questions that I'll read out to you. Um, the first question is, um, is there a normal value or a normal number for resistance and compliance? I suppose that's a good, a good starting point. Well, yes. Um, however, um, the variation is huge. Uh, you're talking about in normal person, in fact, in pulmonary function tests, um, you can, there's a resistance there, airway resistance normal value there. If you go to look at the normal value, the mean, it's a huge uh, uh, standard deviation. Uh, so yes, there, there are some, uh, but unfortunately um, uh, you, you can't just use the mean. So to me, what's more important is the, the chain, the change, uh, increase or decrease. I mean, honestly, I don't usually look at the airway resistance when I, when I manage the mechanical ventilator patients because it's so variable, I pay attention to those four basic parameters uh, I mentioned in the lecture. Pressure, volume, time, and flow. Yeah, but, but like the 3D approach. Yes. So we have another one um, from an another friend, Rob Chapman, who, who likes these topics very well. And his question is optimal frequency is based on expiratory time constant because an expiration is assumed to be passive, right? But we often see active expiration in very sick patients such as COVID. And he would like to know what advice would you suggest using ASV or AVM in these patients? So if you were gonna be using these close the two modes on the patient with active uh, expiration, you have to take away the drive. Uh, most of the time you have to paralyze. Uh, otherwise, that time constant, because time constant, if you remember that equation, time constant is such an important uh, parameters in that equation. If time constant is wrong, the whole thing is wrong. So in those patients with active expiration and you wanted to ventilate these patients with the ASV or AVM, you have to paralyze these patients. But, you know, I think you probably have to paralyze anyway because they're, they're probably pretty sick. That's why they have active expiration but at least you have to deeply sedate these patients so that they don't have active expiration. Time constant uh, is one of the most important, it's the most important uh, parameter in, that, in those equations. Next question, um, does lower tidal volumes um, lead to lung athleticism in patients, especially in patients with an even lung compliance? Can you say that again? Sure, the question is, does the, lowering the tidal volume, reducing tidal volume, lead to lung atelectasis in patients, um, and especially with patients with uneven lung compliance? So I'm assuming that you've got um, one lung volume different to the next lung. Right. Yes. Um, uh, it, we actually saw that um, in that uh, very famous um, uh, ArtNet uh, lung protection, uh, low tidal volume trial. So um, the trial uses six cc per kilogram, uh, but you know, in some patients and we were not able to six, we went down at, at some point during the trial, actually we went down to like four to five. Uh, you see the electasis and the patient becomes very uh, agitated and tachypnic. Uh, I think those are all caused by the electasis and also um, the, the, the fact that the the bottom is not not optimal, it's just too low um, and probably affecting the oxygen because of the electasis and the shunt. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you lower the tidal volume too much, uh, it's not not good. I suppose that the issue here is though it's all about lung protection because all of a sudden everybody thinks six mils per kilogram is the magic number, right? Um, and, and maybe maybe it is for some patients, but maybe it's four mils or maybe it's eight mils or there's a whole spectrum. So we shouldn't just be looking at one, one number and say, well, right, we have got lung protection because I'm sure we don't. Yeah, so I, I think that's one of the things you brought up the good point because now it's six, well, six to ACC or something like that. But those are just the reference though. I mean, you really need to know the mechanics. 
um, you know, of every patient. And and the, the advantage of these these um, so-called advanced closed loop models is that they actually measure it for you. Uh, they measure compliance, which is more accurate than the resistance for you. So um, so you you might be able to just um, uh, come up with uh, something, maybe five cc is good enough for the, for the patients, or many seven. Um, so it's not it's not always six cc, or it's a target. But I don't think no. you we need to use that number as uh, as the as the bible. No, I think that's that's correct because the issue tends to be um, if we um, you know using volume control or say volume control, then you're controlling say six mils per kilogram, but very likely when you're using adaptive control ventilation, AVM, it's because like you said, it's adjusting to compliance and resistance. So it could well be plus or minus, um, depends on, on how sick the patient really is. So it's adaptive, adaption, right? Right, right. It, it, the you know the mechanical powers uh, using the mechanical power actually gives you um, a, a an ability to assess how bad uh, the 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 patient's lung is. Right? I mean, you go in there and it tells you that hey, you, you can't do six cc per kilogram. It can only take four because the lung compliance is so bad. Right? So I mean, you cannot cannot ventilate at four cc per kilogram probably, but it at least tells you that the lung is that bad uh, that that you just cannot uh, ventilate this lung with 6 cc. So even 6 cc per kilogram uh, can still cause lung injury in a very uh, sick ARDS patient. So it's- do you, do you think people should be doing um, like daily, if you don't have a modern ventilator, right? Because we, we know around the world, not everything is fully computerized, but many, many patients are ventilated with more basic machines. Do you think people should have an understanding or try and do, for an example, a plateau pressure measurement occasionally to, and then, then work on resistance and compliance, at least have some understanding, as opposed to purely peak pressure? And what, what's your feeling? Um, so, you know, I think plateau pressure is important, uh, especially when you are on volume uh, ventil ventilation. Now the pressure ventilation, that pressure limit there is very close to um, plateau pressure, so you probably don't don't need it. But the volume ventilator, you have to do it. I think you have to do it, especially in ARDS patient. You got to need you need to know what the plateau pressure is. Um, that gives you the lung compliance. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, you know, for the ARDS resistance is not as airway resistance is not as important. But compliance on the ARDS patient is very important. On the asthma, it's not the opposite. Uh, so I think if you're using the volume ventilator, you have to measure in ARDS patients, you need to measure plateau pressure probably at least every day. At I least. mean, the, I suppose though with, with asthma or, 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 or COPD, severe COPD, then mm -hmm. it's going to be more about rate. Right. It's, I mean, the, I mean, a lot of these um, closed loop, I didn't really get into it um, today because a lot of these closed loop models, the like ASV and uh, those things, it, it has some issue with the obstructive uh, lung disease um, because, in part because the time constant is fairly long. Um, so if you put it in that equation, the respiratory rate tend to be low. Um, but these patients don't normally breathe at 10 times a minute when they are well. Uh, so there gotta be some way uh, to uh, take into account of their baseline. They're breathing probably 20, 20 times a minute when they're well. But if you go by just the time constant, and I have that experience before, you know, when I was first started at ASV many years ago, and I have a patient in the ICU and I put an ASV on there, it's a COPD exacerbation. And I look at the rate, it's eight. Um, and the tidal volume is like 600. But the patient is absolutely comfortable. She was uh, awake totally and very comfortable. She's just not uh, not natural. That's not the combination that she will breathe. You can survive on. But you know, there's no doubt about it. I don't think she has her work of breathing is very minimum. Uh, she was, but that's not the not the combination, you know, for the patient uh, when they're off the ventilator. 
price. Yeah. Um, it looks like we have no more questions. So um, I think I think everybody's had a good understanding of 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 your topic. It's a good topic, Tony. I really appreciate you talking about it. Um, it's very important for us too because this is like part of the stepping stone of as we talk more and more about closed loop or adaptive ventilation or, or whatever the future is going to be. But this is a very important part of understanding respiratory mechanics and I appreciate you joining us. Thank everybody for um, your attendance and we appreciate it. There'll be more to come. Thank you again. Thank Thanks, you. Tony. Thank you. Bye.